Well, welcome again, everyone. Uh, I think we will get underway now. It's now five minutes past the hour. I think uh, we've given most people a chance to come online. We are, of course, recording today's session. So um, if you have to leave at any point, don't worry, the um, video will be available. This is, uh, I think, the third in the Education in a Pandemic series of EDEN webinars, EDEN, the European um, Distance and E-Learning Network, um, one of the peak bodies in Europe for the promotion and support for new approaches to teaching and learning using technologies. I think uh, today's topic couldn't be more timely. One of the urgent questions facing us as educators today is how do I probably design and manage assessments in online learning environments, or perhaps that should be how do I manage alternative assessments in online learning environments, because we're well aware that many of you have had to generate new forms of assessments in light of the challenges we all face, and in particular, the difficulty of running traditional examinations. Um, we want to explore a number of questions, but mostly we want to listen to and hear your questions so we can respond to them. But certainly issues of academic integrity will no doubt come up. How can we ensure that our students are not cheating um, when we move to these alternative assessments? What measures can we put in place to ensure that learning is happening and to assess it effectively? I think rather than take a, an approach that's a little negative, we would want to focus on a much more positive educational opportunity that new alternative assessments provide. So I think without further ado, what I will do is um, give the opportunity for the panel to introduce themselves. But if I haven't already done so, my name is Mark Brown. Um, I'm the director of the National Centre Institute for Digital Learning based at Dublin City University. Um, if you're wondering about my accent, I'm originally from New Zealand, so that helps to add a, a Southern Hemisphere perspective, although I'm sure we have some colleagues I see from South Africa here. Um, and hopefully from Australia and New Zealand as well. Um, the one thing just before I introduce my colleagues again, is just to reiterate that in your questions, rather than use the chat box, can you please use the Q&A tool as that will help us collect them and make sure that we respond to your questions as much as we can. So without further ado, it's my privilege to introduce you to Fredo, who's going to just introduce himself for a few minutes rather than me talk about him. I think it's probably here, better to hear firsthand. So, Mike, over to you. Yes, um, uh, good afternoon or uh, good morning, because there are some people from South America. Um, my name is Alfredo Suera from the University of Porto. I'm a member of the Executive Board or Executive Council of Eden. And um, I've been working on e-learning and uh, on university lifelong learning for a long time. And I think that uh, I have to congratulate first Eden and the president and the secretariat and my colleagues in the board to have chosen uh, this series of webinars, especially this topic. I think it's really important. So <clears throat> I will start um, talking about... Um, Perhaps, Alfredo, before you start, could we yeah. just introduce the other two panellists sure. that we have, and then we'll hand back to you. So, okay, perfecto. So, Lisa, would you like to just give us a little introduction? Hi, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Lisa Marie Blaska. I'm a, 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 a program director at the uh, University of Oldenburg at the Center for Lifelong Learning. Uh, where uh, I'm responsible for the management of technology enhanced learning program, also a program in which I teach. Um, I was a former member of the executive committee for the at, at, within Eden, um, and I'm currently a chair of the board of senior fellow of fellows uh, for Eden. So that's all there is for me. I'll pass it on to or Orna. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, yeah, so I'm Orna Farrell. I'm a colleague of Mark's from DCU. Um, I work in online programs there, so our DCU Connected, uh, I suppose, platform. Um, I'm program chair of three online programs in the area of humanities. Uh, I also do research in the area of online student engagement, e-portfolio, and teaching online. So back to you, Mark. 
Right. Well, thank you for the brief introduction there. Just helpful to contextualise. Each of our um, presenters will just talk for about 10 minutes. Um, any longer, they'll get the evil zoom eye. Uh, and then the plan is that we'll try to devote at least 20 to 25 minutes for answering your questions. With the size of the group, I would just ask you again to post your questions in the Q&A tool. Lots of questions are stacking up there, which is great. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand back to you, Alfredo, and you can start off. Thank you. Okay, so I apologize uh, for breaking what we had agreed, but it, uh, it comes a little bit from, uh, let's say, uh, the intent of uh, speaking about something that I'm very interested in, this question of management. I think it's one of the most important issues in learning, and especially on online learning. Uh, currently, in the days that we are living, that it's uh, really important to correctly assess uh, what students have learned. So <clears throat> I have just two topics, um, and uh, they are different. One of them is uh, how to help the assessment choice. Uh, and I will talk about uh, a web tool that uh, it was produced on a European project. After a thesis produced by Dr. Rita Falcão, She's, she was the one who made the model, but you'll see how the model was implemented and how you can use it to find your correct uh, assessment. And the second part of my presentation is about an experience I've been conducting for some years, this last year with a certain variation, which is the use of ePortfolio for formative assessment online. And um, it was not done online, it was a blended uh, experience, but it can be reproduced easily online, so that's why I bring it here. And um, so, like I said, the project uh, that I wanted to talk to you about was uh, this done, done five years ago. Now it's uh, probably very useful for some of you. And uh, what was the purpose of this uh, European project? Uh, we wanted to know uh, what the students have learned. And for that, we needed to align in some way the correct assessment with the learning outcomes. As you know, the learning outcomes or competencies, as you want to call it, they are very different. Mostly we assess knowledge, but we probably need now to assess skills because we are online. We also need to assess attitudes and we have to find proper assessment for these three types of uh, learning outcomes or competencies. And that's what the project did. Um, and uh, you think it's simple? Uh, probably not. Um, it, it's something that it's really difficult. Um, we are choosing our assessment methods based on mostly uh, on our experience as students and as teachers, but we need a rational approach to this, uh, to this uh, choice or this alignment between the different type of learning outcomes. Um, this is the web tool that I want to talk to you about. It's public, it's free. Um, and um, anyone can use it. And let me be clear, it's just an advice. It's not black and white, it's not mandatory, but it's an advice. And it's an advice based on, you can see the model uh, that uh, was behind this project, but as you can see on the last, um, oops, sorry, on the last, um, row, you can see that it's uh, based on the revised Bloom taxonomy, the, the, the several types of um, uh, the, uh, perspectives of uh, cognition. And um, you, what you do in this tool is just write your description of learning outcome. And when you write, you choose the dimension of the revised Bloom taxonomy there is more appropriate to that learning outcome. That's your decision, of course, as a teacher, that's your decision. And then you'll find on the last box, you check the assessment methods that are proposed. Um, let me tell you that at the time, it was very difficult to find the proper uh, procedure to do that. Currently, with artificial intelligence, probably it would be easier. But at the time, we used, um, matrix that was uh, multi-dimensional and we use the theory of Anderson et al 
to align the learning outcomes with the um, uh, revised Bloom taxonomy. And this is an example. For instance, this is a decision making from a project uh, where there is a framework for the competences of uh, civil engineers in Calohi. Probably some of you know about it. But for instance, for decision making in that project, you have a descriptor that has three dimensions knowledge, uh, skills, and attitudes. And how can we evaluate? As you know, most of the um, of the um, exams or assessments that are made are written. So you, you have a um, uh, multiple choice or you have a set of questions that you provide to the learner, but do they are adequate to evaluate attitudes or skills? So this, this last row are the three methods that the model proposes as uh, probably the best ones to evaluate uh, the type of learning that we are intended to do with the tool. You have the address. If you want to know more, there are several examples. Uh, I mean, the partnership worked very hard. It was a very interesting project, one of the best in my life, and I enjoy it very much. That's why I'm talking about it, because I think it's useful and proper in these uh, days. The other uh, example that I wanted to, to, to bring to you is the, um, uh, the application of ePortfolio. Uh, this is something that I've been, done, been doing for years. These are on the last year of a master that we have for professionals, engineers. And um, this time, uh, we made a, a very big change. Let's say that the evaluation of the ePortfolios was not done at the end of the semester. But start, I started doing it every week. So the students had to put in the portfolio uh, their, what they think um, were the competences they acquired in that week. They had it to justify with documents and other uh, thoughts. But mostly, they had to do something that it's not very usual in these portfolios. They had to put the percentage of them of the competence that they had acquired. Uh, some of them were, of course, very optimistic, 100% in all of them. But then I had a weekly meeting with the students to discuss what had they done. And it was very useful for me to understand the benchmarking of the plan of the discipline. On the other hand, to follow up uh, the progress of each one of them, and with some of them, I had to tell them, you have to look into this, uh, in that book, or in that article, or that link in the web, but you have a problem with this um, competence. So this is what we did. There are some results that I think that are interesting from this application. I was just reading a paper from Orna that says that the e-portfolios were a failure in Ireland. Maybe this uh, is something that I haven't seen, so maybe she will change her mind. We'll see. But anyway, what happened in this e-portfolio is the teaching with remediation, because yeah, I really did it. The e-portfolio is compatible with Europass, the new Europass that will come in effect uh, very soon. Um, the conscience about acquired competences. I was in an engineering school where the competences of the program were written even in the rooms, in the classrooms, all the competence they were supposed, so they know why they are there. They, they are not there because we want to torture them. They are there because they, they are supposed to acquire some competence. And that's very interesting with this proposal. Of course, um, uh, a reflection about what they have learned and it's transparent. In these discussions every week, it's transparent. What I'm supposed to do, what they've learned and how I can assess what they have done because this, it's very good to assess what the students have learned. And just some final remarks. Uh, it's in a minute, Mark. I, I'll finish in a minute. Um, one of the things I've learned through all my years, I'm not young, I'm, very, I'm relatively old, is that uh, assessment is very teacher dependent. And the teachers are very possessive about the assessment. They are very emotional when they discuss assessment. It, it's not rational, the discussion about assessment. I don't know why. I'm not a psychologist or a sociologist, but it's true. Um, another one is that uh, 
we don't have many assessment methods based on rational, uh, rationality. And we need something that it's rational, that uh, at least uh, aligns the learning outcomes with the assessments we choose. Another one, uh, like I mentioned already, is that we have different type of competences or learning outcomes. This is very used, uh, we use it in professional terms for FEANI, some of you may know, but it's the Federation of Engineers in Europe. And we use it because it's um, uh, very useful also for competences besides the learning outcomes. Uh, another one is that um, we probably are not doing assessment according to the learning styles and the portfolios give us more uh, knowledge of what is the student and how he learns. So I think it's very useful from that perspective. And the last is that this question of assessment and accreditation and qualification and validation of competences of people, I think it will be the main function of universities, but at least a crucial function of universities. Let me tell you a story if I can, it's only 30 seconds. Okay, 30 seconds. It's, um, I, I belong to a council on engineering, continuing engineering education, and once the, the director of Stanford, the CPD of Stanford, arrived in a breakfast and he said 10 years ago or 12 years ago, all our courses are online. And everybody at the table said, what? <laughs> now Stanford courses are online? All of them? Yeah. And how do you, what is the business model? Well, the business model is that if you want, anyone wants a certificate from Stanford that they had the competences of that course, they will go to Stanford and pay. So think about it. And that's about it. Thanks, Mark, for the patience. Well, thank you very much. Um, I've just been keeping a watch on the questions coming through. Uh, and there's a question there, which I think we could probably just answer right now around whether the first example you showed, the tool, is yep. still freely available. And if yep. it is, perhaps you could uh, post the URL with more was, information. Okay. It's in the... It's in the, the, the slides, which I think will be available afterwards, but I'll, I'll write it down for all panelists. That's no problem. That's great. Um, I think rather than uh, take any other questions now, we'll just continue on. And at this point, Lisa, I'm going to hand over to you. Great. Thank you, Mark. Let me put my slides up here quickly. Hi, everyone. I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, what we've done here at the University of Oldenburg. And, and prior to that, as part of the um, uh, part of the Masters of Distance Education and E-Learning program at the University of Maryland, and that is use of, of, of e-portfolios and portfolios for, for assessing learners and applying a, a backward design in, in doing so. Now, the Master of Technology Enhanced Learning, MTEL program, the focus of which is developing skills and competencies to support the implementation of flexible and media-supported educational projects and programs within organizations. And the course where we applied the backward design was the Theory, Principles, and History course, which is really the basic course for, uh, for the entire program. And from there, students move on to learning more uh, basics, uh, their courses in research, um, learner support, the design of courses, budgeting, globalization, and then to management. And so in focusing on this first course, which was the foundational course, we really had to think about what kind of learning outcomes did we want to have, just not for, not just for this course, but for the program uh, in its entirety. So what is backward design? The, the approach that we used is the backward design, backward design approach. And this was, is really starting with the end in mind. What do, what do your students want to learn? What are the key ideas and concepts? Um, really focusing on, on what do I want to achieve at the end? Um, and then how will I have students achieve these desired learning outcomes? And how will I assess these? What kinds of rubrics will I use? Uh, and then how will students achieve the desired results uh, and the knowledge and the skills? And the way that we did this, um, we first looked at what kind of learning outcomes did we want to have. And these were things like, you know, that they have a knowledge and understanding of technology enhanced learning, that they, that they can apply it within their work environments, um, that they could use, um, use uh, technology uh, for learning, um, and then that they, and then that they uh, complete specific learning activities uh, uh, to be able to achieve that. And that, so moving from the desired learning outcomes, we first 
defined what it is we wanted them to uh, have at the end of the course and even at the end of the program uh, and then moved into what kinds of assessments would we use to assess whether or not they've they'd achieved that and then specific learning activities so the specific learning activities and the assessments it was important for us that our students because they're within a technology enhanced learning program that they also learn a lot about different technologies now i'm not going to go through this entire slide because we really don't have a lot of time to do that you can go back and look at it later uh, we identified a number of different learning activities uh, that we could use within within the within the course things like a reflective learning journal uh, different things like connecting with the research community, using an online mind map for the personal learning environment, working on a group project, uh, that, that sort of thing. So looking at the entire course at the end, uh, we organized it according to waves of distance education and e-learning and how it's developed over time. And we looked at it um, not in terms of the eras, but really as waves of development over time. And during that time, uh, during the, as we moved through the course, students uh, developed a group grid where they were looking at all the different factors that were, that, that emerged in each of these different waves, things like societal, political, technology, uh, economical factors, uh, and how those influenced the development of distance education and e-learning over time. And then they also um, had to do, uh, follow a, um, a researcher within um, distance education and e-learning over Twitter or some other form of social media and report back to the class so they would start developing their network over time. Then during that time they'd also uh, keep a reflective learning journal which documented many of the things that they learned, how they learned, um, and then those would be reviewed by the um, by the instructor. Now these were all pass-fail formative assessments. It wasn't required for them um, to get a grade on these particular activities. Uh, and, and it wasn't until they submitted their final portfolio that they received a grade. Um, so pass-fail was the grade that we gave for the many learning activities they did during the course, and then the final portfolio, uh, which would be their final reflections, their personal goals would be in the final, uh, in the final grade. And then participation would be uh, a self-assessment activity on their part. Now this is an example of a portfolio that a student did, um, a paper portfolio. Um, she's put together an executive summary, talked about course learning outcomes, talked about key competencies that she's achieved, and then she includes all of the different learning activities, the results of them in her portfolio. This is an example of the e-portfolio where student, the students actually moved this portfolio into an e-learning environment. This reflects um, what Helen Barrett talks about, the two different faces of portfolios, one where it's uh, more of a reflective uh, activity and the other where it's more showcasing your abilities. So why did we use this approach? And I think this will be helpful for you if you're thinking about assessments and how you wanna re redesign them for the future uh, and, and in your online learning environment. Um, it, it really focuses on what students need to learn instead of focusing on, okay, I've gotta complete all these tasks, how do I do it? What are the key topics? What are the most important themes that they need to, need to learn? It emphasizes formative feedback and development, so giving a pass fail on the different learning activities. It also draws on their intrinsic motivation because what we did was we defined unique and contextual learning activities for the students. Um, in addition, it encourage, ref, encourages reflective practice where they have to really think about what they've learned, how they've learned it. And as an instructor, it gives you a holistic view of the student. You see how the student is interacted within the classroom. You get a really good idea of, of who that student is. Uh, you get a picture of who that student is. And that the reflective learning journals is another way of, of, of really getting a, another way of communicating with students. It also helps them to develop their digital skills uh, by using digital media, and it gives them a platform to showcase the competencies and skills they've acquired. Some practical guidance on how to use e-portfolios and the backward design and this kind of learning, uh, learning activities. Uh, get to know your students, find out what it is that, uh, what, where, where they're going to need scaffolding, where they're gonna need help. Create an environment where your students can explore, create, collaborate, connect, share, and reflect. Uh, and it really should be a place where they feel safe and where they can try out new things and where they are really involved in, um, in, in designing their different activities um, or, or their different uh, assessments. Use the portfolio as a place for students to explore and reflect, um, give them an opportunity to think about not just what they've learned, but how they could apply it within their context uh, and make sure that you design learning activities that can build on skills and competencies 
And then the really, the really important role as an instructor is to guide them with your feedback and with, exam, with, with your example. Keep the learner at the center and uh, make the portfolio the centerpiece of, of the course. And then here are some resources that um, I pulled together that can possibly help you in your uh, future assessment development um, when you're thinking about what kinds of things, um, what kinds of things you want to do with portfolios. Uh, and also, there's a number of um, examples here that you can go to uh, links that will that will guide you in getting your online assessments, getting your assessments into the online learning environment. So, did I make the ten minutes, Mark? I think that it was fine. You'll, you'll still get your badge. Um, <laughs> and um, again, with one eye on the time that we want to have as much time for q and I'm going to just go straight on to uh, Orna because I know she's going to have a, a element of portfolios and then we launch straight into question time after that. So Orna. Sure. I'm just going to share my screen. I actually don't have as much portfolios as usual, Mark. So hi guys, uh, I'm Dr. Orna Farrell from DCU. For those of you who have joined a bit late, my handle is there on Twitter if you want to get in touch or my email. Um, I was thinking about, woo, uh, I was thinking about this, this interesting pivot or whatever people are calling it right now. Um, it's very complicated, but in some ways it might be an opportunity. Um, so I picked that Churchill quote to kind of illustrate that. So out of intense complexities, intense simplicity emerges. So maybe this is an opportunity to kill some sacred cows, get rid of some dead wood. Uh, and, and the sacred cow, I think we're all thinking about is this. Um, and the question I was thinking to myself about this was, do we really want to replicate this online? I mean, is it that good that we want to keep it? Um, what do you think? Um, you know, how do you feel about the current exam structure? One thing I find about exams, uh, there's a lot of ritual and process around exams, bureaucracy, checking papers, uh, security. Um, and is it worth all that effort? Um, so I'll be curious, do we want to go for this proctored version of the same thing or should we take advantage of this uncertainty? Uh, and get away, get rid of the dead wood. So I'll be interested to hear what you think. Um, one thing that was interesting, uh, there was a great event online that Maha pre presented at and Mark as well last week called Gasta Goes Global. But Sheila McNeil made a very interesting comment and it stuck in my mind. And she said, do we really want to create an atmosphere of trust or surveillance? So if we go down the online proctoring road, is that just further surveillance? Or do we want to go down the more developmental trust road? So I think that's an interesting quest, question to think about. Here is a lot of GIFs. Um, so again, kind of high level concepts and then I'll get into the, the kind of more detailed assessment bit. But uh, this is a very nice framework by Kahu about student engagement. And, and I adapted a little bit to think about some of the, some of the factors of COVID-19 and how that might be affecting student engagement. Um, so she has kind of four different categories of, of um, uh, thing. <laughs> uh, over on the left there, you have structural things. So there are things like life load. And I really like this concept. So this is the sum of all the caring responsibilities a person has. It could be children. It could be older parents. It, you name it. It could be all of those things. And I think everyone, uh, everyone's life load is considerably different right now. And I think we need to think about that. You know, uh, they could be uh, frontline workers. Their, their spouse could be a frontline worker. So there's a lot of issues around how much time does that person have? Um, the other thing is institutional supports. A lot of these are done in bricks and mortar still. Even if your library is good about buying eBooks and good about subscribing to online journals, there's still gonna be a gap for the students. There's still gonna be things they can't find. And certainly I know from my own students, there are stuff they can't find, particularly the history students. They're looking for art archival material. Some, is, some of it is digitized, some of it is not, and the archive is closed. So what do you do? Um, and the other structural thing which is important is course design. Now, I don't want to get too fussy about course design because I think the kind of change to online teaching recently has been remote emergency teaching, you know, do your best, 
to try and help your students, support them, and I think that's fine. But if this keeps going on, people are going to have to think about more orchestrated ways of designing their courses. The psychosocial stuff is interesting. Teaching support is an obvious one. A bit of work I did recently about online teaching, uh, uh, part of a project called Open Teach. We did focus groups and questionnaires with students, and we asked them what made a good teacher, essentially, an online teacher. And the things that came up weren't content knowledge, professionalism. The things they wanted and they thought made a good teacher was empathy support, flexibility, responsive, and good communicator. So I think those, th those attributes are worth thinking about. And it kind of echoes some of what Maha was talking about, about caring, a caring approach. The other thing which is really happening, and again, I'm, I'm hearing this from my students, is technical problems. Um, my students are online students, so they typically would have a good laptop, good broadband, they would have the tools they need, but there's a lot of students who've been chucked online, uh, the shops have sold out of laptops, the Dell supply chain, chain to China has been interrupted, um, so they may not have the tools they need to learn. Also, they may not have the broadband. I also hear about people sharing laptops. So when we're designing assessments, um, if you want a short timed exam, is that going to be possible? Is the student going to have the bandwidth to do that? Other things, belonging, again, for campus-based students, um, they may not be used to this kind of online community thing, so there might be a little bit of work needed there. And the last end behavior is time, and it relates to life load. Um, and again, how, how people's time, you know, how much time will they have to engage with assignments? And will there be flexibility of time built in so that if they want to learn at one o'clock in the morning, as many of my students do, that that's actually, you know, facilitated. So I hope you enjoyed those gifts. DCU um, developed some principles for crisis assessments, which, which are quite nice and, and quite simple. So there's four principles there. So validity. So try and maintain the connection with the original course uh, uh, learning outcomes. Equivalence, so is it roughly the same as the, the, the exam it was originally intended to cover? Uh, proportionality and academic integrity and you know, you, different ways to ensure academic integrity. So those are the kind of overarching principles that have been guiding our uh, crisis assessments. So in, some, in most cases, that's changing exams into different types of assessments. Again, it very much depends on the module and the course and how many exams they had. Um, in my own course uh, courses, we have uh, a program focused approach to assessment and feedback. And to be honest, we don't actually have that much exams. We have uh, a modular course designed for online adult students and with a lot of choice involved as well. That, that has advantages and disadvantages, but we did still have a few exams. So out of the 32 modules, I think we had 10 exams still. So we still needed to kind of rethink how we would do those. But I thought I would give you a flavor first of our approach to assessment and feedback. Every year around March, we create a Google Sheet like this and we align the assessment plan with the module learning outcomes and the program learning outcomes. Um, and then we then bring that to our program board and we discuss and, you know, and one of the aims of creating this matrix was to increase the variety in particular of assessment types. Uh, also, just to make sure that all learning outcomes were covered. In particular areas we struggled to cover in the past were commu uh, oral communication, because you know, that's a bit more challenging online. Uh, the other area was collaborative learning opportunities. So those are two areas we, we sought to improve. Um, so now we have this mat matrix going for about six years. The other thing is when we started the project, if you looked at that matrix, nearly everything was either an essay or an exam. So, so I think we, we've gradually improved the variety of assignment type there. And uh, all these are online assignment types as well. So it might give you a flavor of what's possible. And that was just for the history section. We have uh, four other discipline areas. So what did we do about the ones, the, the exams we had? So as I said, we had about 10 modules with exams. Luckily, the kind of review process had already happened. So the extern had reviewed them. The intern had reviewed them. So we had exam papers essentially that were through our quality assurance method. So what we decided to do was to turn them into open book take home 
assessments and or exams, but I'm not allowed. To, I should call them assessments because that's what they now are. Um, and the reason is, so we give students a week to do them. We use our VLE loop, which is Moodle. We have turn it in, turned on. Oh, sorry, actually it's Urkund. So it'll go through that, that mechanism. So, and we've also told the students by giving them a model uh, example of, of what they're going to get, that we do expect referencing and that plagiarism will be followed up on. And we always very clearly on each module page have the plagiarism policy front and center. And as students submit, they tick every time uh, and sign that page. And, and if you look at some of the kind of best practice guides, it's in that zone. The other thing I think was important in our decision was that this approach is low bandwidth. Yeah, so asynchronous mainly, uh, flexible as well. So people could, you know, work away for a week at any time that, could, that they could. Uh, and that's important to us because, you know, for our students, they have a lot going on in their lives, even outside of coronavirus life load wise. Um, so that's our plan. Here's some other ideas which I drew from a resource, a DCU resource, um, and the link is at the bottom. I'm going to share the, the Google Slides link, so it's down the bottom for the whole set, and you can keep them. I'll also tweet it out later with the hashtag. Um, so the portfolio, Lisa and Alfredo both talk about that, and I, I'm a huge fan of ePortfolio for many of the reasons they, they describe. They're authentic, they're personal. You really get to know the student. They're hugely hard to plagiarize, although I have heard of people buying reflections online. Um, the other thing I really like about them is they're incremental. So you build them up over time. And the best ones, you know, are like every week or every month, a little bit and add a little bit more and look back on the previous one and what have I learned? And it's very, very iterative. Um, so I think it's a lovely approach to learning, uh, but, I don't see in a kind of a crisis, I must get an assessment ready in a couple of weeks that it, it will work, but you never know. It depends on people's timelines. The other one I really like is a collaborative wiki. So I use the, the tool within Moodle. And actually what I started doing was getting the students to pick a Wikipedia page, critique it, and then use that as food for thought for their own wiki. Yeah, so instead of saying, oh, Wikipedia is awful, don't use that. Uh, actually get them to critique it and apply their critical thinking skills. Uh, the next step I'm hoping to do is get them to live edit Wikipedia. I haven't quite got there yet. Another really nice one is an asynchronous online debate. So we, we use this quite often. Um, so you pose a, a you know, debate style question for, against. You tell, you know, give the student guidelines about how much they can write, what type of information you're expecting, source quality. Uh, and then you also build in loops to make them comment on each other's. So, you know, you know, comment on Lisa's or comment on two other students. And then at the end, you get, let them choose their best five. Other stuff there, there's some interesting ones like the vlog, a blog podcast online presentation is really good but some of those i wor worry about because of the bandwidth and the technology requirements so i'd kind of urge a bit of you know careful consideration there uh, the last one i like as well the peer assessment uh, we, we use that a bit as well so for example create a short video explaining a psychological concept and then we use the workshop tool in moodle to pair up groups of students to give feedback on that, you know, that example. So we've used that in lots of different ways. There's also some other cool stuff. One of my colleagues, Eamon Costello, I'm not sure if he's here, uses a tool called Peerwise. Yeah, I see I'm getting a warning there. Uh, and that gets students to create their own quiz questions and then comment on each other's questions. So I think there's some good ideas. Have a look at that, uh, that link if you like. One other thing that's a quite a nice one about academic integrity, this is from a, a project, uh, a EU project that DCU is involved in. So they're kind of principles for academic uh, integrity, but for assessment design. Um, so just to pick out one or two, because I reckon Mark is going to start giving me dirty looks, but some of them I've already co covered. Ensure they're authentic, current and relevant. Uh, integrate them across the program. Uh, include elements for students to think, uh, demonstrate their own work. And what I would say is make them as context bound, personal as possible, because that, that makes it much harder to plagiarize. Collaboration, so, uh, this, and from this Australian resource, I, in my head, collaboration would disincentivize um, 
plagiarism. But this Australian resource uh, that Mark was referring to in the chat as well would actually suggest collaboration increases the chance of plagiarism, which is interesting. Um, so very, very interesting resource. Have a look, contract cheating and assessment design. We've mentioned a lot of these, but things that are very hard to, uh, to buy vivas and actually that would be i saw a question in the in the q a there early how do i ensure um you could uh, how do you ensure that the person actually created that so the viva tool is very good and you could do that online uh, or i mean i have used that in the past for students that i suspected of plagiarism but but couldn't necessarily prove uh, a short viva well no Please. i think i'm gonna uh, start you, stop you on that note um, i'll just show your web page though um, well, that can sit there in the background. There you go. I thought you'd like that. Um, we have uh, just a, a mass of questions coming okay, through. Okay, will so I stop sharing or...? or... Stop sharing, um, and I think we'll go into a Q&A mode. What cool. I'd like to ask the panel members to do as well is to go in into the uh, Q&A tool, and if they are able to, or others are speaking, answer some of the questions there. We'll do that as much as we can. But just to get things started, um, the questions are falling into a number of um, sort of class clusters, if you like. There are some bigger questions around, and on it to some degree, you challenged us in the start of your presentation um, around the sort of paradigm shift that was also one of our opening questions and the challenges that assessment bring about. Then there are some questions much more pragmatically about online proctoring, what systems, how we stop cheating. Um, then we have some questions around uh, the actual pedagogy of assessment in relation to workload, principles, and so forth. So I think what we might do is just start at that bigger question, um, and I'm going to ask um, Lisa, you to come in first, if you don't mind, and then we'll go to Alfredo, around the bigger question about how you get people to engage in alternative assessments that might clash philosophically or pedagogically with their normal approach. Oh, wow. Well, that's not an easy question to answer. Um, I think when you're, it isn't just the instructor that needs to reassess or rethink the way that they're going to uh, do assessment. It's also the student that needs to needs to uh, to really accept that that new kind of a, of, a, of assessment. Um, it's really, I think you need to 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 rethink how you're going to assess students. It isn't going to be a matter of giving them a test anymore at the end. You really need to give them a, a more formative, um, a for, more formative experience where you get to know the student, where you get an opportunity to to see their work over time, to provide feedback so that they can improve on their improve on their work as they progress through the course. Um, how do you convince instructors to do this? Um, I don't, I, I'm not really sure because we don't really have much of a choice right now. If you're going to move into an online learning environment and you want to survive and you want to have a good, solid, pedagogically based teaching and, and learning environment, you're going to need to rethink how you do your assessments and how it is that you present your, your, online, uh, your online content. So I really, I don't think that it's a, a question of, I don't think that we can easily convince instructors. Um, I think right now, in order for you to really uh, survive in this new environment, it's going to be essential for you to rethink how it is you're going to approach teaching and learning, um, which is going to mean uh, thinking about assessments and, and coming at it from a, from a new perspective. Alfredo? Alfredo, do you have uh, any thoughts? Well, yes, like I said, um, my experience after all these years is that um, um, teachers are very possessive concerning their evaluation of students. I don't know why, uh, but uh, uh, it's very difficult to discuss um, assessment with any teacher, believe me. It's my experience, my personal, I don't know about yours. So. What I think is that has to be a decision of the instructor. He has to study. I, I'm, I'm going to ask you frankly, how much time did you spend researching the correct mode of assessment? And then you'll see that most of the people that are teaching and assessing, they did it. They just used the assessments they learn when they were students and their colleagues do, et cetera, et cetera. So, 
my point in Eden and in other conferences is that we need more research, more training on this question of assessment. It's the less studied part of this teaching and learning uh, paradigm. In order, I'll give you a chance to come back in on that bigger question around the sort of beliefs that people have about assessment and how you address that. To some degree, you touched on this when you talked about working in a programmatic way. So you may wish to expand on that. Yeah, um, we, we experienced a lot of challenges um, early on when we were trying to change that. And I suppose what we tried to use was a very evidence-based approach. Um, so we would, those who, who didn't agree with the change, we would present them with the evidence, uh, you know, on that assessment type and show them that, listen, the program currently is not assessing communication, oral communication. We need to get a learning outcome here. And also we used feedback from the students as well, who, who were looking for different type, uh, types of assignments and not just, you know, writing 12 essays every year. Um, but it was very gradual. I think that was the thing you know, we, we'd find someone who was kind of interested and open and we'd work with them one year and then we'd use them as an example to the other colleagues and then a few more would come on. And over time, uh, you know, that the, I suppose the super tanker started turning, but it was very gradual. And I do think there's something about pedagogical or philosophical beliefs. Some, some people just really believe that essay is the right way to assess uh, an, a literature student, for example, uh, and they just refuse to believe there's another way. Um, disciplinary resistance, I call it. Okay, um, we're multi-processing here, folks, trying to answer as many of your questions in the chat as well. Um, I think before we move into perhaps uh, the area that a lot of you have an interest, which is around academic integrity and cheating. Let's take an educative approach and ask the panel about the designs that they might have and ways in which they would address in um, assessment that's alternative assessment to an exam, but maybe scheduled over a longer period, perhaps 24 hours, I know a few people are suggesting. So what sorts of assessments would you choose for a defined time period, but it's not really meeting the criteria of continuous assessment. Um, I'm gonna give you, Alfredo, the first chance to come in this time just to share the mic. Okay, thank you. I mean, I'm, I, I use a lot Turnitin. Uh, so there is, um, uh, in, in my university, there is this tool that we can use. So I use Turnitin, for instance, for, for homeworks and others. But in terms of, for instance, of problem solving, um, it's very easy to, to, to verify if, uh, if uh, I'm an engineer, so I teach engineering, it's very easy to verify if there is uh, uh, plagiarism or, or multiple solvers in the same program. At the same time, I think that, uh, for instance, if you want to do a multiple choice and you have a large bank of questions, you can adapt for each student an exam that it's different from the next one. So it's, it's not easy to, to, to have a, a plagiarism when you, even when you do a multiple choice or uh, other type of uh, computer-based uh, assessment. And uh, Lisa, do you want to come in at, in particular, talking about some of the design considerations in the way that you need to manage um, an assessment over a time period? Um, what we did, one example that I can give you, um, and, and this is where we, you really have to be creative in the design of your assessments. Um, you have to make it contextual, you have to make it relevant to the student. Um, for example, one of the assessments we've used is uh, to have students define a strategic plan. And in, in that case, it has to be a strategic plan within their institution. And then they have to take that institution and then do a comparison. How would I implement something, for example, within my institution? How would I implement e-learning within my institution? What kind of challenges are there? What kinds of strengths does our institution have? What kinds of weaknesses? These are things that, that wouldn't be really easy to, uh, 
um, to copy or to find uh, or, or to plagiarize in that sense, because what you would have to do uh, is in this particular assignment is to take that contextual environment and, and to apply it to the assignment. Um, it also intrinsically motivates the student because it's something within their environment that they're actually addressing within the assessment. Um, another thing that I found really helpful in terms of the portfolios in any case is when we have the reflective learning journals, we can see certain writing patterns with our students. We, we know how they're thinking, we know how they're addressing certain topics. We see the same sort of thing within the discussion forums. So you're able to get a really holistic view of, of, of who that student is, their writing abilities, where their shortcomings might be, um, what things that they need to explore further. Uh, and so if they submit an essay later that doesn't fit to those two other forms of assessment where you kind of go, well, this doesn't sound like the same student that did this reflective uh, uh, reflection within their learning journal or has been posting in class. Um, I don't use Turnitin, but I'll often go into Google and just enter some of the text in an essay and say, okay, is this, you know, this doesn't sound like the student that I've come to know within my class. Um, and so, uh, so it's a good opportunity, I think, to, to identify where there might be plagiarism. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Orna, I'm, I'm just going to come in and move the conversation on and give you the first opportunity. So you're the one throwing with the question at the deep end. But um, something that's coming through uh, in the various questions, I think, is this issue of so if even if you are rescheduling the assessment so it's over a 24-hour period how do you know that it is the person who is meant to be responding i.e the identity of the person preparing the assignment this is a, an interesting question in many ways because for written assignments outside <laughs> of examination that question comes up regardless at DCU, we uh, utilize a system called Studiosity that provides formative feedback for written assignments and gives feedback within 24 hours before the assignment is submitted. Some people see that as cheating, but what we know is that from the research that lots of students already ask their parents, their guardian, another student, to give feedback on their assignment before it's written. So um, it raises an interesting question about how important that really is and are we looking for love in the wrong place? Um, on that note, I'm handing over to you, Orna. Yeah, I mean, we've, I've had discussions about this before, about this whole idea that we have to verify the identity. And, but, but what I ask is, do we have to verify the identity for coursework? Um, you know, why is it suddenly more important for exams? But of course we have identity verification. I mean, if you're using your, your, your VLE, you know, the student's ID is there, it runs through a plagiarism checker like Urkund, and we have internal quality methods. So we have uh, what we call a moderator, um, checks a sample of uh, the, the student work. Uh, and then the markers themselves, if they notice something untoward in, in the assignment, uh, they will pursue that as well. I mean, the obvious identity checker is to do a Viva style one mark, but I mean, that's just not doable on scale. So what we do is if it's suspicious, we follow up with a, an interview. Um, and, but, and, and if the quality assurance uh, triggers, you know, this one looks dodgy, we'll look into it. But otherwise, um, you know, relying on both the, the markers I, which I think is far superior than uh, plagiarism checkers like Turnitin or Urkund, they sense if something is wrong. Um, and then the, we have the further quality assurance uh, check. And then actually at the end of the year, the external examiner would often view a large sample of the assessment. So those, those measures are in place. And just to add to that from the, the moderator's role before I ask Lisa to come in and give her a moment to think as well. Uh, one of the um, items, bullet points I know from the many guides that you can access at the moment is that having written assignments that ask people to draw on their own experience, um, whether, for example, if they're a nurse or a teacher or even an engineer, where they're being expected to draw on the context in which they've had to um, do much of their work over the course of the semester. That's just another strategy to enhance the academic integrity of what they're doing. Lisa, do you have any other ideas or thoughts? Uh, 
Um, as I mentioned before, Mark, I think a lot of it has to do with finding out the relevance of the of the of the topic for the student. I mean, even my own kids, my own kids will say to me, you know, mom, they give me assignments. They're not interesting. They're not things that I'm interested in. And I said, well, what is it? What is it that you're interested in? So sometimes it's it's making it the assessment open enough for them to identify identify the relevance. What are the things that I can take from this assessment and apply to my context? How can I, um, how, how, how can I um, make it my own assessment? How can I make it my own, uh, my own way of assessing uh, what I've learned? And, and asking them to define it. I think I mentioned this in one of the answers that I wrote uh, in the chat box is that sometimes it's also looking at, you know, how would I assess my own learning? Uh, coming up with your own um, with your own learning goals. I mean, that's that's. I mean, I know that's a bit further than a lot of uh, a lot of our face-to-face -face, uh, instructors are ready to do at this point. Uh, but it's uh, another pathway that you could take in order to make uh, 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 to make assignments really relevant to students. Is that they are able to say, this is the kind of a, a assignment that I would like to do. Um, and then getting the approval from the instructor to move forward. And uh, I, so I think that's one way of, of also addressing that and making it so that they're more intrinsically motivated and less chance of plagiarism. Because if they're motivated, they're not going to plagiarize. And most problems that we have with plagiarism are because students, um, one, aren't interested in the topic, and two, don't have time to get, uh, to get their uh, assignments turned in. Thank you, Lisa. I think some very uh, sagely advice there that um, certainly drawing on the, the research evidence that the issue of plagiarism in most cases is actually not out of being deliberately um, dishonest, but much not really understanding what's required. That's certainly a study in Australia that I'm citing um, more often at the moment, and also the concern about cheating. But we're getting down to the, the, the dirty side of the conversation using that word cheating. So Alfredo, do you have anything practically that you would advise or what's your own institution doing to uh, address the concerns around cheating? Um, like I said, we, we have the tool Turnitin available, but uh, for instance, it allows, um, like uh, Lisa was mentioning, it allows complementary oral uh, discussions and exams so we can uh, that's what been rescheduled for this uh, emergency in these uh, months that are missing until the end of the year. So you you have to find probably a set of um, of assessment modes that fit not only the purpose of verifying the learning outcomes, but also the type of students and disciplines that we have. There is a diversity. For instance, I'm having an exam next Friday. What what the students will do is that they will share their screen and their sound with me. So it's a way, you know, but there are probably other ways uh, because uh, uh, like it was mentioned, I prefer the ePortfolio. The ePortfolio is being used even for professional uh, use like doctors and engineers and, and nurses, and they are being used to verify their competences, their CPD. So Engineers Ireland, we are talking about two artists here, Engineers Ireland uses the e-portfolios to verify the competences. So if we do it for professionals, why don't we do it with the students? So that would be my, my advice. Uh, find the right ways to do it because there is a large variety of options. So one of the questions that has come through in relation to the use of e-portfolios is that uh, often the advantage of an e-portfolio is around the critical reflection that the learner is able to um, draw on. And the question is, how long do you need to be able to engage in that critical reflection? Is a portfolio something for another day when we have the luxury of more time, or can a portfolio still be used as a form of authentic assessment to address some of the issues? I don't know who wants to pick that up, so I'm gonna let you decide on this occasion. I'll take that mark um yeah when i was thinking about this that that would be my instinct the portfolios i've done with students have typically been over a long period like a year an academic year and i think if you really want that developmental experience um that's what you've got to do because if you give it to them over a few weeks they'll write it all in one day 
Um, but the, the whole thing about making it incremental and having incremental deadlines is you, the structure of the of the assessment, uh, the frequency um, prevents students from doing that. Uh, you know, so if you give that to them over two or three weeks, they're going to write it in one day. That's just my two cent. What do you think, Lisa or Alfredo? He say a little bit this year where we did the weekly either the results were completely different from doing it at the end of the semester because uh, the dialogue and the observation of what they've written and the discussions about uh, what they were supposed to learn and what they support because they had to prove it's not only saying they have to prove that they acquired that part. so it's another way of course these are 22 year 21 year olds but uh, i i think it can be done in higher education without any problem. Lisa, do you want to come in on that note before mm -hmm. I come in and change? Yeah, the only additional thing that I would add is, is to reinforce what, what Orna and Alfredo have already said, is that if you do this over, over a certain period of time, over weeks, uh, and then have it gradually feed into their portfolio and, and whether this portfolio is used for final assessment or whether it's used for formative assessment or whether it's used over a, you know, a couple of months or a year or, or throughout the whole graduate or undergraduate experience. Um, let the let the learner define that you know together with the instructor. Um, but if you do do it do it over a weekly or biweekly so that they're continually submitting, so you don't have the situation like Lorna Orna was saying that that this all gets done done within a matter of a couple of weeks. Um, and I realize that this, these are these are examples that that are long term examples that many of you are faced with the with the problematic of you know I have to find a solution right now I have to do things right now and and it's my best advice for you is to do the best that you can to provide the students the support that they need to be flexible um, but to gradually work toward um, a design that is going to be to, to be useful within a, a online learning environment this isn't something that's going to happen overnight we didn't learn how to become online instructors uh, within a matter of, of, of days or weeks this is something experiences that we've gained over years and years of, of, of teaching in an online environment working with students so I, I guess my last piece of advice would be you know don't push yourself too hard. This is to give you guidance, to give you direction, uh, to give you some ideas on how you might move forward. Um, uh, but uh, you, know, you won't be able to do this right away. But we are really looking at problems that, that are going to become long-term problems. We're not going to be able to go back to the old normal. Uh, there's going to be a new normal. And so what we're trying to do is to provide you with some guidance on how you can uh, adapt to that new normal. Thanks, Lisa. And I think you, you cued us all to also flipping this a little bit to think about the learners here, that uh, when we're choosing alternative assessments, and I'm conscious a number of questions have come up about workload and also the appropriate level of challenge. How can you ensure it's at the appropriate level? I think we do have to think very carefully about um, the assessments, the alternative assessments we choose because not only may they create additional work for us, they may create more additional work for our students. And I'm just gonna give you a quick example from my own university, where some staff who have a very contemporary view of assessment, a very authentic oriented approach, were going to propose that their students produce small videos as distinct from a written essay. And of course, very hard to plagiarize a small video of yourself doing a quick pitch um, in relation to something. But the difficulty there is we would have been introducing to students a new technology that many of them would have had to learn. Um, bandwidth issues right now are actually quite a challenge for some of our students, depending on where they are located in Ireland. But also, I don't know about you, but assessing a video is quite tricky. You have to actually view the video, uh, not to suggest that you don't uh, read an assignment as such but there's a lot of time that comes with that. So those are just some of the fish hooks that my own university has identified around the workload. And then one last thing is what we've discovered is that in moving to an alternative assessment, giving people 24 hours, maybe even sometimes 72 hours in a gap to respond to something, um, we haven't perhaps taken sufficient account that the students of their full time might equally have a number of other assessment tasks coming in in that same window. 
So I think if you're not yet at that point, I'd be encouraging you to expand the window for the assessment period or the alternative assessment period. Um, again, do any of the panel members want to come in around this issue of workload, um, the challenge, that is that the appropriate challenge, or anything else? Or no? Well, I suppose that's what I was trying to capture with that student engagement framework there from Kahoo. That, uh, I mean, I'm just thinking about my own experiences uh, with small children and cats, and also even uh, my children's schools emailing completely uh, really big uh, lists of homework and having too high expectations. And I think when you, you're on the receiving end of that, if, if, if our students feel like that, uh, I think um, we're doing something wrong. Um, so I think we have to be very mindful of the life load stuff. The, the bandwidth is, as you said, Mark, uh, a lot of people talking about their broadband is, is really not very reliable. Uh, and cool things like short videos are great, exactly as you said, but as long as the students know how to do them, have they ever done that before? Do they even, you know, do they even have a, the, the right technology to achieve that? So I think why, while, you, you know, you might be gravitating, and I personally would be guilty of this. Oh, that sounds like a cool assessment, really different. Uh, maybe this isn't the time to do it. You know, this is the time for the simple, not the brilliant solution, as Lisa was saying. Um, so that's my that's my final word on that. Folks, uh, if you're wondering, um, we're way over the hour now. We got underway a little late, and and we had to keep. Um, uh, as much as we can the time. The expectation is that we might continue with the Q&A for another five minutes or so. Um, we're going to struggle, I think, to answer all of the questions that have come through, but hopefully we're touching a lot of the points in this conversation now. Um, one, just to change tack, and I'm going to get again into the sort of challenging aspects. Uh, there have been a number of things that are challenging in that at a nuts and boltsy sort of level. Uh, a number of questions about online proctoring systems. What are the best systems? Would they um, use a system now? Uh, are there open source systems and the so forth? I, I know I have particular views on that. I've had to share those in my own institution, but I'll let the panel start off on the first note as to whether you think um, an uh, online proctoring system is the way to go right now. Oh, I'll start. Uh, I think it's expensive and difficult to implement, so I, I, I would skip it, personally. I would prefer something that it's individualized, like it was mentioned by the panelists already, and, um, and um, define assessment uh, for the individual. Not, not, but don't try to verify the, to replicate what it was shown by Orna, to replicate what happens in the exam room. Uh, I think uh, that's a problem with e-learning. Uh, also something that we have to uh, deconstruct what the idea we have of higher education and education that is face-to-face -face and rethink you have to rebuild a new um, uh, scenario for e-learning. We, we use a lot of the face-to-face -face in the um, uh, we try to replicate and that's very difficult online. That's my, my, my contribution. Lisa, any thoughts on, on that? Has, has Oldenburg explored online proctoring at all? Uh, no, we haven't, not at the moment. And uh, so I really can't say much to that topic. I was right in the middle of answering a question in the online chat. So <laughs> my mind is somewhere else. <laughs> okay, well, let me, I said I had views in order. Since we're at the same institution, I'll just jump in because it has come up on a number of occasions. So I do want us to have addressed it. Um, in my own institution, one reason that we're not exploring online proctoring is even the bandwidth considerations. And we have it from very good sources that our um, major providers, internet providers, are prioritizing basic infrastructure and particularly healthcare support. Um, so you can understand that support for education does not quite stand at the same level as support for our health systems. And we know we use Moodle as our um, BLE or our learning management system that there have been small outages, no more than a minute or two minutes from time to time, completely outside of our control. And um, even though we've quadrupled the, the support that we have in terms of the size of our pipe and the like. So I personally would not be recommending any kind of live proctoring um, at 
DCU owner actually was leading the charge here with a pilot in this space, but I would not be wanting to live pilot. But ultimately, and I'm on a soapbox here, if that expression makes sense, and I'll, I'll stop in a minute. I think this whole conversation about alternative assessments, and we started on this at the start first question, and the first question that came through, really challenges us to why we assess learners in the first place. Um, there's lots of things that people learn that we never assess. In fact, you could argue some of the most important knowledge is not assessed. And I'm going to quote from a famous book from David Perkins many years ago, where he talked about the need to move from away from training memories to educating minds. And I think um, to some degree, each of the speakers have touched on this in the sense and challenging some sacred cows about why we're assessing and how. Um, so that's me standing off my soapbox, but I certainly would not be advising people to be involved in a, a live pilot of a proctoring system, but very happy to take any questions directly via email because we can share our experience as to why we've made that decision. Um, panel members, uh, that was a lengthy sermon for me for a minute. I think let's just look an eye on the time, give you all one last chance to come back with a final comment. And while you're just preparing yourself with a final comment, so I don't completely drop you in it as you multi-process answering to the Q&A. Um, I think, uh, again, People are asking whether online assessment can be academically, have academic integrity, can it avoid cheating, can it raise the, ch uh, the challenge to the same level. All of these questions for me actually are asking the question of why we're assessing in the first place and some principles which each of the speakers really touched on order in the last talk was quite explicit around those principles. Um, one of the things I think you need to be thinking about in alternative assessment is um, who are your learners and what do you want them to learn? And therefore, what is the best um, assessment technique, task approach for those purposes? And that's my little, I guess, last word um, at a conceptual level before I ran, round up thanking everyone. So reverse order this time. We're going to start with Orna and end with Alfredo if your last word on um, alternative assessments and the challenges we face in managing assessment. Well, I'm going to go with my own acronym, um, the KISS method. Keep it simple, stupid. Uh, no, but I, I really think, uh, you know, considering the times, you know, simple, low bandwidth, asynchronous, flexible assessments uh, are the way to go. Don't overcomplicate things. Really good communication with the students. You know, we've been having lots of things like town halls, Q&As, uh, model assessments um, so and we've been tr we've been trying to be very transparent with the students about you know our plans uh, and so far that's worked well for us yeah I can only reinforce what what Orna has said as well I mean it's important that you're there to provide feedback that you communicate with the students that you support them that you're flexible this is a very challenging time not just for us as instructors but also for our students uh, if I were to incorporate any kind of assessment um, that I've mentioned today it would be the reflective learning journal because this is an opportunity for for you as an instructor to to see where the problem areas are for your students where are they struggling how can you provide additional support uh, what kinds of things are they having you know really having struggles with um, it also gives you insight into how they're learning and what they're learning are they are they really um, learning the things that that you want them to learn uh, and how are they applying it within their context so I think the, for me, the, the Reflective Learning Journal would be an opportunity for them um, to reflect not just on their learning, but on the current experience that they're going through right now. Writing can be a very, um, a very helpful process in, in working through a lot of the things that, that we're being confronted with, a lot of new things that we've never been confronted with before. Uh, and so that, that would be the assessment that I would recommend. Okay, my turn. It's it's very simple. I, I, I presented in the Eden Conference in Dublin some years ago. Research, research, and research. We, we have to study more this question of assessment, online especially, but in general, but online, uh, it's more needed at these days. And the other thing is, uh, is that uh, we have great networks. We have 
have great um, uh, people that are willing to share their experiences and what they have done. I think Eden is a great space. Uh, we're going to have a virtual conference in next uh, uh, June. So take advantage of it and join these networks where we share these things that each one of us is trying to develop and improve. Well, thank you, Alfredo, for that um, little prod for me to give Eden's conference a, a plug, which I had to share done the today. slide. So I can now tick that box as well. Um, Want me to share the slide, Mark? Yes, thank you. I think that was my job. Sorry. Your last slide. Uh, yeah. Is it? So uh, you've got an opportunity to uh, attend and participate and contribute virtually to the uh, Eden conference in June. Um, no doubt we will be having lots of talks about um, the experience we're going to have over the next few weeks in my own university. Um, most of our face-to-face -face teaching that would have been has been now completed virtually last week. There might be a little bit still going this week and then we move into this alternative um, virtual examination slash assessment mode. And I assume that most of you will also be doing that over the next month. Uh, we haven't been able to address all the questions. I hope we've managed to give you something to go with. There have been lots of very useful resources posted and we'll try to follow up um, when the video is available with links to some of those as well. But on that note, I really want to just thank um, Orna, Alfredo and, and Lisa for their contribution today. Um, I should also acknowledge that um, Tim, uh, one of our executive members, has been behind the scenes trying to keep a, a track of our um, questions coming in and helping us prioritize those. And then Diana, um, who's hosting the Zoom room for us from her institution, thanks to her and all the other administrative team from Eden who helped to make these sessions useful. We're not waiting another week for the next session. Um, the next one, I believe, is in a few days, if I have got my correct um, schedule right. But the next one is very timely too, because it's on how you evaluate um, in an online environment. So having gone through all of this and done the assessment, I think evaluation will be very timely. You might just want to check the website for the precise date. I don't have that at my fingertips here. Watch your emails otherwise. But on that note, um, thanks all for attending, participating, contributing. And until next time, um, have a good week.